in the top. And there we are, one, two, three, and we should be live. Live, live. We hope. Hello, darling. This is Tuesday. Hope you're all well and ready to tune in and have a little bit of interesting conversation. We've got a great guest for you today. Yeah, we just check because normally we see one or two peeps. And we I just want to make sure and double check that we are actually All the technology stuff is working yep absolutely okay. so mm. today should be real fun with paul ferrante he's oh, a yeah. great guy god bless him yes he's a he's Retired. been a teacher oh. for 40 oh, odd God's, years yeah. i said to to him the other day when we were um doing mm. our test i was yeah. like oh good grief you know hi rick um he's, he's yeah. been at, locked in a room with teenagers for 42 years oh, he deserves God. a medal Absolutely. we're just uh, yeah. waiting for yeah. him to come on to yeah. our uh, stream here but so interesting thing about yeah. paul is that um hello barbara hunterman thank you Hi. for calling us pretty ladies hello, in green darling. Very, albert hello darling very kind of yeah. you so yeah. Hopefully, okay. Paul um, mm -hmm. comes on shortly. Um, so, yes, anyway, today's guest, as you will see scrolling across the bottom once he joins us, um, is Paul Ferranti. He's written several uh, books, the TJ Mysteries. And the clever thing about that I like about them is they've oh, got know. John Lennon threaded through every single mm -hmm. one. Oh, I know. He weaves the Beatles and yep. lots of things about them into fictional books which is a great way of when he was a school teacher getting history across to kids by just sneaking in little interesting stuff about the Beatles which would make them stay with it and get more interested than just history and it's a really great way to introduce young people to you know to reading and studying more and so forth real life so, history come along then. paul where are you no, he's not here yet he's not here yet no, he's I've probably in hair and makeup do you think he, no yeah well maybe <laughs> um so the book we're going to talk about today yeah. is called 30 minutes in memphis yeah. and it is a beetle um a beetle story about when the beatles went to memphis in 1966 and we've got a very our very own signed oh, cool. copy Name um, dropper. I know mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. So we should uh, hopefully get him here soon. But yeah, thank you very much, Tim Kendall. Love the love the green. Well, green is uh, you know the international sign for money. That that's what we're hoping, and that's what we're all hoping that? for. Do this you remember year. that stuff before Bitcoin? Absolutely. You know the green paper stuff. Yeah. So but, uh, um, yeah, we've got a lot of hopefully a lot of Beetle folks tuning in today. So what we're going to try and do in the future with T Flix is get. Uh, some more beetly related, because that seems to be, you know, obviously a demographic yeah. that makes sense, mm -hmm. beetly related folks to come on so that we can then share them in the groups. But when I was interviewing Paul the other day, Ferrante, um, he was telling me how he has intricately woven the spirit and the ghost of John Lennon throughout yeah. all of his books. So I wonder if he's talked to Jude Sutherland Kessler, who is... I don't Ultimate know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. John Lennon scholar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just going to yeah. look and see if I have a phone number for Paul. I don't think I do, but the test, of course, went seamlessly the other day. And now, where are you, Paul? And now, we of need course, you. it is not there. But anyway, so here we are in a brand new year. Happy yeah. New Year. Happy New Year. Is yeah. it, it if is you our, dare. It is our first of yeah. this year, isn't yeah. it? 2021. Um, I don't uh, know. No, it's, I don't These know. Tuesdays all blend 12. into no, each we other. we had five last week, five and 12. Oh, that's right. 12. Yeah. So we, uh, I did speak to um, Mike McGear in Liverpool for all of those who wished him a happy birthday on the 7th of Jan. He's doing great. Yes, he's fine. Um, he was, of course, disappointed that they couldn't go out to, to dinner in Heswell. Yeah, he said he was going to go out to the fridge for his birthday. Exactly. <laughs> out and to the so kitchen. so here is our Paul. Here is our guest Hello. of the day. Let's Good see if morning, we can all Paul. hear each other. Afternoon, ladies. Hi. Good afternoon on the East Coast. Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Good. Everything's uh, going great over here. It's uh, kind of a chilly day, but not too bad in New England. Wish I was in California. <laughs> yes, it's, yeah, we're it's actually going to have a heat wave this week, so it's going to be, uh, I think, eighty degrees on Thursday. Oh, shut up! Which is no, it's. <laughs> No, it's just crazy. <laughs> I know, heat dropper. Yeah. And uh, Albert Prococo from St. Charles, Illinois, and Barbara Hunterman is uh, saying hi to you. I think you can probably see the, the chat streams here. So that's great. Hopefully. Good. So tell the folks, I was just doing a little preamble about this that we're featuring today, 30 Minutes in Memphis. Right. Um, but what I was fascinated with the other day when we did our technology test 
is uh, how you've managed to weave the spirit of John Lennon throughout your TJ stories. Yeah, uh, my book writing started with the TJ Jackson mysteries back in 2013. And uh, starting with the, uh, the first book, really, uh, TJ is the protagonist. He's the hero. He's a teenage kid who does paranormal investigations. Yeah. His, his wingman, his best buddy, is this nerdy kind of crazy guy named Bortnicker. And uh, I decided to get the Beatles into my books that I was going to make Bortnicker uh, a Beatles aficionado. And, and so he is just consumed with the Beatles, everything about them, trivia, the songs. Uh, he, he's always doing a, a very poor John Lennon imitation. So uh, once the books got rolling, uh, the, the second book found the kids in Bermuda. And as you know, John um, took a trip there, the, the, the famous sailboat trip. With, um, Elliot, Mint, with Elliot Mintz. Yeah. I mean, and, with him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so what I decided to do was I created a character who's the driver for the kids while they're there because they're all they're only like, uh, you know, 15 uh, year old kids when the, when the series starts. And so he's there to drive them around. And um, he's an Afro Bermudian. So what I did was I made him uh, a friend of John Lennon's, a guy who befriended John during his trip there. And so he's kind of the conduit between John and the kids, as it turns out, because later on in the book, which is called Spirits of the Pirate House, um, when the kids are in the middle of their investigation, Bortnicker hears this person like whispering in his ear, giving him directions because they're looking for the grave of a, a pirate on this estate. And uh, as it turns out, it's, it's John's voice. So even though John didn't do a full on appearance in the story, he makes his first appearance in that particular volume. And then the Beatles theme continues here and there through the other books. And book number six that's coming out this summer has the kids in London and they take a side trip to Liverpool and they end up in the Cavern Club. <laughs> and and uh, just to I'll, I'll, just to give a little hint, um, John does make his first spiritual full body appearance to Bortnicker at the Cavern Club. Great idea. Very Wonderful. Good. I Very think good. It's fabulous. Yeah. And uh, have you finished writing that book yet? Yeah, that book's in edits right now, and we're looking at this July. Oh, great. Oh, okay. Good. Well, we'll have, yeah. you back. we'll have you back on when that comes out, please. Yeah, yeah. it's the, pub is the publisher's Fire and Ice books. Great. All right. Fantastic. And uh, in our uh, ticker crawl here, people can see uh, your paulforenteauthor.com, as well as, of course, the ubiquitous Jeff Bezos planet we call Amazon <laughs> that delivers everything from uh, dog food and toilet paper to interesting <laughs> literature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So how did you come about the subject of this uh, Memphis 1966? Because you don't live in Memphis, do you? No, don't live in Memphis. Never been, although that's that's probably first on the bucket list uh, of United States destinations once the travel restrictions uh -huh. kind of ease up. Um, I chose Memphis in 1966 because I thought that this was the turning point for the Beatles. Um, and not only in their music, but in just about everything, you know, it's when they stopped touring. It's when they started really speaking out uh, on important issues instead of holding back as Brian Epstein had pleaded with them to do. Um, so, and, and it had a big effect on me too, because uh, at the time uh, in, in 1966, uh, I was going through a Catholic school here in uh, New York state. And when the Beatles, um, yeah, 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 I know, yeah, I know. Okay, and, and, <laughs> and when the Beatles made their appearance on the Ed Sullivan Show and everything got rolling, uh, my teachers, the majority of which were older um, Irish nuns, um, you know, you know, the word heathen was uh, thrown around quite a bit, dirty, unkempt, communistic, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so. Not nice. Not nice. Not so nice. Not nice. once they caught fire, though, uh, by the end of the week uh, with the Sullivan show, we always we already had um, laws in place, uh, rules in place about boys not being able to grow their hair over their collars, over their ears. I mean, this was by the end of the week. 
Really? And yeah. so you couldn't, but you couldn't stop the Beatles. It was a runaway train. But then when John made the famous uh, Jesus statement in 1966, when, it, when, when it everything hit the fan, so to speak, uh, that was when a lot of the teachers came back at us and said, you see, we told you, you know, and, na- and now look at the, look at this statement. And it, it touched off a firestorm, uh, especially in the South. I mean, it started in the South in Birmingham, Alabama, yeah. but then it spread throughout the country. It even spread up into New England. Um, it spread to upstate New York and uh, everywhere in between. And I just thought that this was an incredible um, event. And because I wanted the story to, to have a, a theme and to teach a lesson, I thought that this was the perfect uh, opportunity because the main character, this girl, uh, Marnie Culpepper, she's a 15-year-old girl. She's growing up in Memphis. You know, she's in the Bible Belt. Um, she's a good girl, uh, but she's a Beatles. She's an absolute Beatles fanatic, you know, reflective of thousands and thousands of girls across the country at the time. Yeah. And uh, the thing is, when John makes that statement uh, in preparation for them coming to the Mid-South Coliseum for the August 19th, 1966, um, two performance appearance in Memphis, uh, she is faced with the, um, with the problem of uh, either renouncing John Lennon and the Beatles mm-hmm. to her friends, to her church, to everyone else, or continuing to be true to what she believes is right and to be loyal and to support him and his uh, right to free speech. So that's really the perfect, it was the perfect storm for a coming of age story for this girl. Well, and it's actually the, the perfect storm for what's going on now in, you know, in America with some people saying it's free speech, some people saying it's hate speech. It's, it's a very difficult place anytime the situation crops up. Yeah, time. Yeah. Right. Well, Marnie, Marnie is faced with this, you know, and the thing is, um, you know, not to tell you the whole story, but, um, you know, she comes from a broken family. Uh, her father is um, a Korean war veteran who suffers from what we t- today call PTSD, uh, which leads to her and uh, he, he and his wife breaking up. The, the mother runs off uh, the weekend that Kennedy's funeral is being held. So uh, Marnie is just totally devastated. The only thing that she has is the Beatles because they hit the scene within a week or so of that. And and this is kind of what saves her. And so she isn't, like I said, an ultimate fan. Her room is plastered with all the stuff. She buys all the records. She knows all the words. She's in love with Paul or, you know, or John, a given, you know, yeah. d- depending and what day it is. Given day of the week, right. Sure. Yeah. And uh, the, her kids and her father realize that, you know, she's a little crazy here, but uh, her father cuts her some slack because he knows that the Beatles are probably filling a void for her that he can't fill. Yeah. But, but when this happens with John Lennon uh, and she has tickets to go with a, a good friend of hers, a, a boy who buys her the, the ticket for her birthday, yeah. when she has a chance to go to this concert, she's like over the moon. And then a week or so later, the remarks become public and they go viral and now she's faced with all these choices and on top of it and this is all based on history she finds out about uh, a a plot by a uh, a white supremacist group to uh, to do some harm to the boys during the evening performance uh, in Memphis Um, and by all accounts and believe me I researched the heck out of this book they were they were terrified of this one stop on the tour and um, and so if it, you can go on YouTube and you can see some of the actual videos mm-hmm. of uh, members of some of these groups making threats. Uh, and um, they were they were pretty uh, scared about this and just hoping to get through it and right. finish the tour. Well, the history behind that, as I understand it, is when the Beatles very first toured America, their, their first tour post the Ed Sullivan appearance when they went down to D.C. and Miami when um, they saw the contract that Brian was presented for some of these venues, they said, no, we're not playing to segregated audience. We're absolutely not. We're, we're, you know, 
I mean, pre all you need is love, but they, they were always coming from a place of integration and, and inclusion and, you know, oh, all of Liverpool, that stuff. Definitely. Yeah. Because, I mean, talk about, you know, Liverpool and how long it's been, you know, had a Chinese and an African population. Eh? Absolutely. I mean, I was born in 1929 on Merseyside and I grew up in Liverpool not knowing a darn thing about racism until I came to live in America some 30 odd years ago. I just wasn't aware of it because people were from all different races. They all married each other and raised kids and it just didn't matter. Right. You know, I, mean, I did not the, know about racism. Liverpool really. was uh, incorporated in the 1300s mm -hmm. and we have the first Chinatown outside of China. Mm -hmm. And so, so many Liverpudlians are of all stripes, all origins, all faiths, mm. all colors, all whatever. And that's what the boys grew up in. Yeah. And when you think about, you know, they were actually wartime babies. They were all born during the war. World war II. You exactly. don't think of them as, you know, 80 years old, uh, thereabouts. And so, you know, all of a sudden when this opportunity was given to them after Hamburg, and Hamburg is another port city. It's very, very integrated. Oh, yeah. uh, I mean, largely white, but a lot of people coming and going through Hamburg. And so as the Beatles, they just didn't understand yeah. when they came to America why this was, you know, they could play only to white family. people. Yeah. So that is why historically these white supremacist groups and then John ironically in a statement of what I think he meant for to be, isn't it sad that we that can we sell are, more yeah. tickets than kids go to church? Yeah. Oh, that that right. quotation was very much misquoted. What he said to Maureen Cleave was not exactly what was reproduced. I mean, he's, yeah, there's a tape of him saying it, but the way he meant it mm. for the thing was, she's, isn't it sad that? Know, isn't it know, sad that? Isn't it a reflection? Know more about us. Is yeah. the reflection of the times that? you can get more kids to go to a Beatle concert than you can to church on Sundays. And then he made that famous statement, which of course, even in those days was plucked and taken and put down in its, you know, without the before and the after. Right. So yeah. he was, I mean, I, I was only six years old, but I remember the conversations. He was just mortified. He's like, but that's not what I meant. Yeah. Right. We all knew that. Yeah. Well, the other reason I picked 66 was uh, during the summer of 66, my parents decided in in their infinite wisdom, because I lived in New York. I was born in the Bronx, as they say, but I lived in New York and we decided to do the family road trip down to Florida that summer. It was August. It was incredibly hot. There was no air conditioning in the car. It was me, my brother, my sister. Roll down the windows, right? <laughs> That's right. And, 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 and you know, yourself, yeah. But I distinctly remembered as we passed through the Carolinas and Georgia going into public facilities where the signs were still up from when they were, you know, segregated, you know, white only, white restroom, white, uh, you know, uh, drinking fountain, et cetera. So I guess I guess 66 always kind of just stuck in my mind for that reason. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it was it was a very uh, big historical year. There's another lovely for for Anglophiles. There's another movie actually called 66. And it's about a kid who gets his bar mitzvah and it falls on the day of the World Cup and England's playing. <laughs> yeah. And it's, of course, the Beatles again, are as there are in many movies woven into the fabric of, of history. Have you ever been to Liverpool yet? Well, I was in Liverpool one night. This is kind oh. of crazy. this is kind of crazy. But my wife and I, um, we went on a tour of Scotland. Um, I'm sorry, and, uh, a tour. We went on a tour because <laughs> I, you know, I wanted to see the, the the Highlands and all that kind of stuff. We'd been to London uh, once before. So what happened was we went into London, and from there we bust to Liverpool where we stayed overnight and then from there the bus left and it was all over Scotland. So I really haven't been to oh. Liverpool because that's that's number one. I have two places on my European bucket list. Yeah. And uh, I've got Liverpool and, and I wanna see I want to see Normandy. My dad's a World War II veteran oh. who's, who's still with us and uh, you know, I would love because he never made it to Normandy, but I would love to see that too. But Liverpool is that, you know, I'm going to do the whole nine. I'm going to do the tour. I'm going to go to the Cavern sure, Club. I'm going to do sure everything. Let me know because I will send you to some real groovy places, Paul. I promise you. 
Fantastic. Well, uh, when the kids in, in the TJ book that's coming out in uh, the summer, when the TJ uh, kids go to Liverpool, um, they go to a lot of the, the you know, I, I researched all different tours. So I kind of picked and chose where, where they went. Uh, but they end up at, at the Cavern Club. And, you know, these are, I learned a lot about the, all the different places and all the different haunts and the, and the, um, the pubs that are still there and, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, all the places. Uh, well, the grapes, they, they the grapes on Matthew Street, which is where they all used to go for a pint in between the sets, you know, um, that opens and closes depending upon whether they paid their utility bill or not. So always check that out because <laughs> yeah. that can get the grapes can be a little iffy. Yeah. Um, but anybody who, including you, is going to Liverpool, you must avail yourself of a copy of Madam's latest tome. It's a pocket-sized book called Here, There, and Everywhere, and it's available signed from Mrs. McCartney's Tees dot com as well as, of course, Amazon. And it is a Beetle tour guide for Liverpool, London, Hamburg, New York, and Los Angeles. And every single page has one of these flow codes. It looks like they're QR codes. You've probably seen them on restaurant ordering menus now and labels and things. They're like crazy crosswords. And we're working with a great company out of New York called Flow Code. And every single chapter has its own code that you scan with your smartphone. You just open the camera, hold it over the book, and then it launches a page on McCartney.com that has videos and uh, links to tours and you can find out the weather at the time and all of those great things. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a good travel companion for your, uh, for your trip when you go. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to a, to a, an autographed copy. You know what I've been doing lately is I've I've been uh, exchanging books with uh, other Beatle authors, you know, autographed copies and I've read, you know, just in the last few months I've read some uh, great stuff and uh, it's fun connecting with other Beatle authors because you know, I'm not a Beatle author per se. I'm not a Beatle scholar. I'm right. some uh, I'm a lifetime enthusiast who who did a heck of a lot of research on this. Oh, you uh, must have done. And the, the thing is, you know, when, when you deal with with this genre, uh, just like when I write baseball books, which I've also done, you've got to really be sure on this because people are going to call you on stuff <laughs> oh, if you I get know. it wrong. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. No, I mean, I know, yeah. I, I'm not a Beatles yeah. scholar uh, nor an author of any kind. And uh, sometimes it's like, you know, stump the stepsister or stump the stepmom and people will come on here on T-Flix on Tuesdays and say, what was that time when, or do you know how? And, you know, I honestly would have to go and look it up. There's just so much history. Yes, you, can't think, yeah. you know, there were four of them at the core, and then there was George Martin and Stuart Sutcliffe and Billy Preston and Brian Epstein and all of the yeah. peripheral players. Pete Best, the, of course. Pete Best, yeah. the, the so-called fifth Beatle, or about two dozen fifth Beatles. Yeah. And um, David Bedford, who is a mutual friend of ours, Beatles, uh, Beatlesbooks.com, I think it is, or .co.uk. He's done a great, a great book. Um, Liddy Pool. Well, Liddy Pool is one to, is to one great Pools, book, yeah. but he's done like 101 tangential. It's like a huge family tree yeah. of every band, every everybody ever played with, with Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. So, yeah, Paul, you're right. There's so many real true scholars out there. And I understand that at some colleges and universities you can actually get a, a degree in the Beatles I mean what's what kind of jobs are going to get you <laughs> I know I, I actually uh, did a podcast a couple of weeks ago on one of the co-hosts of the show which is called uh, get back to the Beatles uh, it's off the Boston Podcast Network. One of the co-hosts is a professor at Suffolk University in Boston, and he actually teaches courses in the Beatles. And I'll tell you, as a former mm -hmm. teacher, I just retired after 42 years. Uh, to be able to teach a Beatles course or teach Beatles courses would be a dream come true. I, I used to uh, shoehorn them into my curriculum every year for uh, about a week uh, when I was doing my poetry and because I was an English teacher and it was the most fun week of the year. Uh, the, kids, the kids always loved it. Yeah. Well, we do, okay, well, when you could still go out and breathe on people, we used to go to El Camino College here every year and do a, um, you know, an afternoon as guest lecturers with um, Professor William down there. And he actually taught a Beatles course, but it was, it was very interesting in as much as it was about um, musicology and all the ties back to, you know, the, the classical music um, and the Aeolian cadences and then the Dixieland and the jazz and the blues and the skiffle. But then he also, part of that course, which I'm assuming some of these others are too, 
is about pop culture, marketing, branding, yeah. uh, all those things that we've come to live with today and how far ahead of that curve Brian Epstein and then uh, NEMS and then ultimately Apple were. When you think about, you know, they created their own label and their own publishing company. They wrote their own songs. Uh, it really did change the music industry for decades. That Now, again, it's screwed with the likes of these streaming services where you can pay $10 and all you can eat and the artist gets subdivisions of a penny. Yeah. We're back to the old Robert Barron days. Uh, don't get me started. No, don't. But, um, don't go there. You know, when I, I, I sort of, I don't laugh, but I, I'm like, good God, of course, in the Beatles, really? But when you look at the whole entirety of everything from the musicology and then the business management and publishing and copyright and Ooh, all Everything, that, fashion, yeah. lifestyle, food, cars, yeah. everything. There's I've so got much. a couple of yeah. um, documentary series in the works about you know, literally how they, how they changed fashion and then the art side of them. You know, they were all artists. They all either painted or took photographs um, outside of their music. They they really had, you know, an artistic bent, especially Stuart Sutcliffe, who unfortunately we lost earlier. We have a couple of his reproductions of his pieces from his late sister, Pauline. And uh, they really were, it was just an incredible time in history that smashed them all together. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, about 60 years later, still talking about it. Yeah. Well, I remember watching Beatles cartoons while they were still you know popular you know I mean, it was, you know they were everywhere yeah. they were everywhere mm -hmm. and then you've only got to talk to mark and carol lapidos at the fest for beetle fans about all of the merchandise there is now big christmas ornaments and bobbleheads and still lunch boxes and all that sort of stuff if you you know if you just look on the merchandise side of things it's it's crazy crazy so do you have any specific i mean nobody really has any dates yet do you have a dream date of when you'd like to get to liverpool well, uh, my wife's from Lisbon. Oh, beautiful. And, and, and she, she came uh, to the States when she was nine years old. Wow. Um, so I've been to Lisbon quite a few times, and we have to get over there to attend to some family business on her end. Right. But, you know, I mean, the place is on lockdown, and it's yeah, been impossible. You know, yeah. once once Europe opens up again, you know, we have – you know, we'll have a base of operations there that we could, you know, pop over to to, right. to England. You know, I, I mean, I'm looking forward to it. it. There's just so so much I learned and so many places that I, I want to see in person. And of course, I go on the different uh, Beetle uh, websites and pages, and people are always, you know, on YouTube uh, posting their uh, their visits. You know, and, and it just makes you want to go. And I can't. Not yet, anyway. I know. Well, there'll be plenty of pent up demand, but if you uh, if you're thinking of going in August, um, book a cancelable hotel room early because that is Beetle Week, and that is the first uh, time in a year that the Cabin Club will be open. We were listening to one of the directors, a friend of ours, John Keats, on uh, Liverpool Live Radio. Pete Price is on on Sundays. Mm -hmm. uh, and Pete Price was on Radio Merseyside, then Radio City for years, and I was his Hollywood um, chat show guest every Tuesday and then Ange did every Sunday for like 13 years and he's just moved stations and it's called Liverpool Live 24-7 um, and you can get it for free as well as any radio station in the world actually at radio.garden it's not .com it's .garden and so before you go start tuning in and listening to the local accent because you'll have to learn to speak Scouse <laughs> yeah I know all right. My brother-in-law brother is from uh, Bath, and um, oh, that's know, rather posh. That's yeah, down, down quite, the right side. Quite different. Right quite, right. quite different. <laughs> quite different. And uh, it was what was funny is um, when I did the the one scene with uh, John um, in the new TJ book, and he's having this conversation with Bortnicker, which is in you know, it's in the restroom of the Cavern Club. Um, I had I had to I had to try to reproduce kind of um, you know the the cadence and uh, you know the, the the use of the word you know a lot uh, yeah. stuff yeah. St stuff that you know the guys used to say okay. but on the other hand and I, I mentioned this to you when we spoke last time when I did this Beatles book uh, Thirty Minutes in Memphis. What I didn't want to do, and, and what I think maybe some other people have taken liberties with, is putting words maybe in their mouths that they didn't actually say or maybe rip, misrepresenting uh, them in some way. And I wanted to be so careful about that. So, 
in 30 minutes in Memphis, they don't, none of them, uh, and they don't say a lot, but in the scenes where the Beatles are featured, none of them says anything that wasn't on the official record you know, that I didn't get from re research. I, I wanted, the only time the guys talk, the only time the guys talk that I made up is there's a dream sequence the night before the, um, the concert and Marnie is having this dream that uh, she, uh, she walks into this room, that she goes down a hallway, it's a dark hallway and she goes into this room and the four of them are sitting there and um, they, they have their, they're wearing the same turtleneck outfits that you saw on, you know, with the Beatles or meet the Beatles, depending on the album that you have. They're sitting around a little table and they've, you know, there's a whole bunch of cigarettes and empty uh, teacups and all this stuff. And John and Paul and George are, are strumming guitars as if they're working out songs, you know, and Ringo's there too. And this is after she's been thrown out of her church and everything, you know, so she walks in and, you know, John says, well, if it isn't the heretic, you know, which that is sounds about right, actually, which, which is something that he would say. And yeah. so that's a kind of a neat scene. But again, it's a dream. It's a dream sequence. Other than that, nothing that they say is something that uh, wasn't on the record. No, that's fantastic. And that's I think great. that's really yeah. great of you to, yeah. you know, pay homage because I, I have read some books where oh, you sort no. of roll your eyes and go, oh, oh they no. never would have known. You know. yeah. But uh, there are a couple of other books actually called Learn Yourself Scouse. And uh, Scouse is, of course, the dialect that we call, you know, Liverpudlian language. And it actually comes from, uh, it's a dish, isn't it? Dish, yeah. Yeah. Scouse, it was uh, a. Um, Originally, it came from, was it Denmark or Norway? Norway, I think. Yeah. Norway, I think, when the seafarers used to come into Liverpool and they brought this dish, their home remedy recipe with them. And then the Liverpudlians made it either lob scouse or scouse, which means a dish with meat, potatoes, and carrots and onions. That's it. And that's it. And this one here makes the most fantastic scouse. Oh, so if come, you come ever scouse. want to market a scouse, <laughs> Come and see my daughter. <laughs> it's half half lamb, half beef. You cut the onions and the carrots. You put them in the bottom of the pan. Bit of butter and olive oil or oil. We used to just use bacon fat in the old days, and we yeah, lard. Um, <laughs> and then the same with the half lamb, half beef, salt and pepper. Turn it over in a pan. Get a crust on it. Bang it in, and then slice the potatoes on the top and some stock. And you just put the lid on and walk away. And the potato, the starch from the potatoes drops drops down, down and thickens the stew. Oh, and then we've got some. Actually. We've got sort of oh, a scouse. We're going to have some right after this. <laughs> and um, but it was S-P-A-A-S-E, S -P -A -A -S -E, and it was a, it was kind of it wasn't a meat dish in the uh, in Scandinavia. It was more like a bouillon base. It was a fish stew, yeah. and they used to put potatoes on the top to thicken the sauce. Yeah. And then, of course, we got hold of it and put beef and lamb in it. And then, for some reason, it became the name scouse. of the dialect. Mm -hmm. So when you walk into the Cavern Pub. And we introduce you to John Keats and Bill Heckle and all the owners and Julia Baird and all the cabin people. Um, if you hear somebody standing next to do next to you at the bar saying, "What's to do with you, lot? You get them in a while. You got short arms or low pockets." What that means is, what, what is the matter with you? you? Are you getting a round of, of drinks, drinks in? Are you paying for a round of drinks or not? Have you got short arms it's and low pockets? low pockets? So what you're saying is it's worse than Scotland. Oh, oh my god. Yeah. Oh god, yeah. Please. Scotland sounds like the Queen's English compared to Scouse. Oh yeah. All right. <laughs> Depending on what... which side of Sucky Hall Street you're on, but <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, Scouse is uh, Scouse it, is Scouse, yeah. It's got its own weirds and everything. Yeah. I'll okay. send you I'll send you um an R rated it's not X rated, it's R rated just because of the language. I'll send you a video later on of uh, it's called just called Upset Scouse Girl. And she's every other word is a bad word, but oh my goodness, yeah. she's funny. She's trying to get to work. She's trapped in her car, and there's a marathon on in Liverpool, and she's got to go to the bathroom. So <laughs> you, can, you can only imagine. So tell folks once again, we're almost out of time here. Okay. Tell folks yeah. once again um, the name of your book and where they can get it. We just, uh, Rick Lawler's just bought a Kindle version. Oh, um, uh, somebody else is buying. One, a, a copy right now so at least we, we sold a couple of copies during the broadcast and Good. then I'll share this far and wide as I hope will you so tell mm -hmm. tell the folks where they can get it and what's the title well it's 30 minutes in Memphis a Beatles story there you go 
and it's available on Amazon in both, um, you know, electronic and paperback. Uh, it can be found also uh, the Beatles bookstore, which David Bedford uh, runs. Okay. And, and, um, and, you know, it's, it's a great story. I'd love to hear feedback from you on it. Uh, I'd love people to do reviews and get in touch with me. Um, my website uh, is in the book, but it's uh, paulferranteauthor.com, all one word. And I love hearing from uh, people who have read the books and having discussions and, you know, what better thing to talk about than the Beatles. Exactly. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your yeah. time today. Yeah, it's been it's great been fun, Paul. Fabulous. Thank I've you. Seen some folks from um, John Bazzini and a couple of folks from some of the big Beatle groups. So hopefully they will share this too. And we'll just keep spreading the love. Yeah. And Thank you know you. what? Someday, fingers crossed, it makes it to the silver screen because I really think it would be a great uh, story to adapt uh, to it a screen. Yeah. It would, it absolutely. Would and yeah. when you do get to Memphis, let us know that too because we work with and are madly in love with a band down there young gentleman by the name of Nick Black. They are nickblackmusic.com. They're based in Memphis, born and bred. Oh, Incredible kids, R&B, just a great, great band. Uh, know every Beatle cover ever written. Yeah. And so uh, they'll- And Nick they'll, Black, by the way, is white, but the band is not. <laughs> exactly. No, it's pretty funny. It's <laughs> very funny. So, they're great guys, though. No, they're, they're, people. they're good brothers. So uh, Nick Black band down in Memphis will take you out, and then our cabin crew will- take you out and hurt your liver when you get to Liverpool. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Beatles and Memphis barbecue. Can't wait. There oh, you go. Absolutely. Well, thank yeah. you so much for your That's time today, time sweetheart. For. And you have a happy and healthy new year. And we'll see you all of a sudden. Okay. Thank you, ladies. Okay, kids. Bye-bye. God bless. Bye-bye.